up guys, uh, Matt here from Laid Loss Harley Davidson. So I'm gonna go over and demonstrate some of the hands-on technical aspects of the Pan America. I'm gonna go over some of the things like seat changing and, and foot peg modification. Then I'm gonna jump into the infotainment system here and I'm gonna go over how to modify the ride modes and how to just basically what every switch and every button on the bike does just so you guys get a little bit more familiarized with the bike. For those of you who plan on getting it in the near future, it, you'll probably learn a lot about the bike before you actually get on the bike, so you have kind of a head start on everything. And for those of you that are thinking about the bike, you'll probably learn a little bit about what exactly this bike offers. So let's start off first with the seats. So right here, there's a key, and this is the same key that you get with the bike. And you've got your, your fob here, which is your security, and you got the key here. So you put the key in here, and what this does when you turn it, it releases the rear seat, the passenger seat back here. So it releases this out, out of the, the hole right here. Now you've got a little bit of a compartment here as well. So you can put maybe something really small, like maybe documents, maybe registration or something like that if you want. But once you take off that passenger pad, then that allows you to slide off the rider portion of the seat here. So this comes off like so. This right here is the reach seat. So this is a smaller seat. Someone who is a shorter inseam, this is a great seat for them. I'm gonna go ahead and put the regular stock seat on here. You can see here the difference between the two seats. So this one has a, is a little bit more pillowy, a little bit more cushion to it. So this basically just slides on very similar to the other Harleys. You wanna put the nose in first as it connects to the, the back of the fuel tank. Then once that's on, then we'll slide on the passenger seat here like so. So the seat is very easy to change. There's also another thing I wanted to show you guys. So there's actually two notches where the seat can slide into. So Nick, if you can get a close-up of this. So there's two distinct notches here. So this is the lower notch and this is the higher notch. So you can actually, within these two seat heights, you can actually raise or lower the seat height by one inch by selecting which of these two notches you put it into. So I'm gonna make sure I put it in the taller of the two notches since I'm on the taller side, six foot six. I'm gonna put this one on. Okay. There is also a tall boy seat, which raises us up even more. So if and when I get this bike for myself, I'll probably get the tall boy seat. I'm six foot six inches, so I'm very tall. I think probably if you're six four or six five and above, you probably want to consider the tall boy seat. Again, this is the stock seat that comes with the bike. So a couple other things I want to show you guys as well. So there's a few adjustability features on the pegs as well. So Harley Davidson has it where you can actually rotate the brake pedal here and that will actually raise or lower the pedal ever so slightly. It's not a huge dramatic thing, but based on if you're gonna be riding off-road or on-road, you're gonna to wanna to adjust this. The other thing you can do is these are like little rubber inserts here. If you're gonna be riding off-road, you're gonna to wanna to pull that out. That way you have the benefit of a little bit more of a serrated edge to grip better on the bottom of your boot and whatnot. So a combination of that, you don't wanna take that out when you're doing off-road stuff. As the dirt and grime gets in your boot, obviously this is gonna grip a lot better. You can start getting water on this thing, it kinda of can, can become slippery. So you take these out, adjust the brake pedal. A lot of times guys will adjust it based on if you're standing up a lot. If you're standing up a lot, you want this a little bit lower so that you, you're not inadvertently pressing the rear brake. So that's one more thing that you can adjust on the fly. This is no additional expense, no additional accessories. This is exactly how the bike comes stock from the factory. Let's move over to the windshield now. So the windshield has four different positions, four different notches here on this uh, height selector. You basically squeeze this trigger right here and then you can move the windshield one notch at a time. The From the highest to the lowest, it's about a 1.8 inch travel or difference between the highest and the lowest position. But you can see here, that's the second to the highest, that's the second to the lowest, and then that's the very lowest. So obviously based on your on your height of the rider and also your preference of uh, looking through the windshield here or looking over it, I usually tell people that my preference is, is my eye line is slightly over the windshield. So I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna adjust it accordingly. Sometimes when you're out on the highway, guys have a tendency to put this up higher. So you got more wind coming at you when you're doing 65 miles an hour plus on the, on the highway. The higher this is, obviously the more wind deflection properties you're gonna have. So this is something that you can adjust on the fly with one hand and uh, set it to where you want it. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna jump into 
the infotainment system and basically show you what all the controls and buttons and gizmos do on this bike so you have a good idea of how to operate pretty much everything on the motorcycle. Okay, first off guys, if you wanna fire up the screen here, there's one of two ways. You've got the ignition here. The ignition, if you press this down, is gonna fire it up. And that's basically how you start the bike. You'll hit this button once. You don't have to hold it down or anything. You press it once and the bike fires up. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into accessory mode so we're not burning the headlamp. I know the headlamp's on. We want to conserve battery, which by the way, if you're messing around with your electronics on any motorcycle, you're going to want to have it hooked up to a battery tender. We've got a battery lead here hooked up to battery tender so we can mess around with this and not worry about discharging our battery. So right here, this is going to be the same as like a trigger switch on top of the switch houses. If you guys are used to a regular traditional Harley, if you hold that down, that's gonna boot up accessory mode. Hold down for about three seconds. So we have access to our electronics or infotainment system without running the headlamp as well and all the other electronics. Right now, we have the odometer on here. The bike is in rain mode. Hopefully you guys can see that. The bike's in rain mode there. You can see the icon up here. And then you got your neutral indicator right here. And then down here, that lets you know that the Adaptive ride height is ready to be initiated. Once that goes out, that you know it's doing its thing, but it has a blinking light before the bike starts to let you know that it's ready to go when it needs to get going. So I'm gonna show you guys first how to mess around with your, your ride modes. So right here, there's these three squares right here. So you press that, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna initiate like your main menu. There's basically five different options here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the gear here. Once I'm at the gear, I'm gonna go down to ride customization. So I'm gonna hit the down arrow, go to ride customization, and then once you click the center. And what's nice here, this wheel to the left, that's like a legend that lets you know which of the three buttons on this control panel are active and that will do something if you press them. So I'm gonna press the check one, and then this goes into ride modes. I'm gonna click on that. So from here, I've got rain, road, sports, I've got off-road plus, then I've got the three customizable modes. So the three customizable modes are off-road slash plus. So this is this allows me to customize an off-road mode that you'd only want to use if you're going off-road. And I've got a custom A and I've got a custom B. Right now you can see custom A is active because it has a checkbox next to it. And then B does not have this indicator right here showing that it's active. So if I wanted to, I could go down here, I could click on the center button, and now that custom B is active. So you'll notice too, that there's a little pen right to the right there. Okay, if you click the right the right button there, you can actually touch it on the screen if you want. That's gonna edit. Now it asks me if I wanna copy it from another mode. So what I can do is I can copy the base map from another mode. I'm gonna hit up, that's gonna hit the check mark right there. So I can pick by pressing up and down arrows, I can pick which of the modes I wanna copy like the base map from. So I wanna copy the base map from, let's say road mode. I'm gonna click the center button, go to the road mode. So engine map here. So this right here allows me to take like the engine mode, like the progressivity of the bike and like the power delivery from one of the other modes. So sport mode is obviously the most aggressive. That's where you're gonna have the full use of the, the torque and the power right out of the get go. Off-road is gonna be a little bit more tamed where it's gonna favor not breaking the rear wheel loose and just a little bit more steady and even power delivery when you roll on the throttle. Rain is gonna be the most tame. You basically, you roll on the throttle and it's gonna build power very gradually so as not to break traction when you're riding in the rain. So I'm gonna pick sports because I want the most aggressive mode here. Then I'm gonna click the left button on the wheel here. The left button is the same as clicking is this back button right here. You can either use the screen or you can use the wheel on the left hand control. Okay, engine map, I got sport, engine braking. So an engine braking, this is basically going to be the amount of engine braking when you let off the throttle that you experience. So like dragging the motor basically. So you can go plus one or you can go max. I'm going to go max. This is going to be nice if you're doing like canyon roads and things like that where you really want to utilize the engine brake when you're going into a turn and whatnot. I think you probably want to go negative if you're someone that is maybe out on the highway that wants to conserve fuel that lets off the throttle and just wants the bike to coast as much as possible. You'll probably go to the negative one. Now throttle response. I think this is pretty self-explanatory when you roll on that throttle and depending on what the throttle position is, it's gonna give you a correlating amount of power based on your throttle position. So if you roll on the throttle really quick, then obviously if you got max, which we're gonna pick, it's gonna give you the most available power. 
Traction control, so I can go sport, road, or rain. Sport is gonna be the least amount of interference with the traction control. Road is gonna be second to the highest intervention, and then rain is gonna be the highest intervention. So if I want traction control to be really sensitive, I'm gonna pick the rain mode. If I want it a little less sensitive, I'm gonna go road, and then sport here is gonna be the least sensitive as far as intervening if you're breaking the rear wheel loose. So I'm gonna go sport. Okay, analog braking, same thing. So analog brakes, this is just basically how sensitive or how soon or how quickly the analog braking will intervene in the event that you're locking up the wheels. So off-road is the least intervention. So if I get if I go off-road, the bike's gonna allow the wheels to slip and skid a little bit more than say like rain. In rain, the ABS is gonna intervene very quickly. I'm just gonna pick the road mode. Okay, so suspension damping. This right here is the only way to basically pick the, the way that your, your suspension is gonna act when you're going down the road. So sport is gonna be the stiffest. So if you're, again, ripping through the canyons and riding real aggressively, the sport is gonna give you the, the stiffest and the most performance-based suspension feel. Balanced is just what it implies, that it's kind of a, a balance between comfort and sport. Now comfort, that's gonna be like your Cadillac feel where it's gonna be really floaty. So if you're going over like bumps in the road, like washboard bumps, and things like that it's going to allow the wheels to float so a little bit softer setting then you've also got some off-road modes as well so you've got off-road soft and off-road firm so these again you're going to want to only use these if the ride mode i'm configuring is basically for off-road i'm going to be riding on the road right now so i'm actually going to go to so let's go sport because i have everything else set up sport so that's going to be a little bit more firm and then you have the adaptive ride height so uh, again this is only on the bikes with the adaptive ride height shipped from the factory it's a thousand dollar option but this basically you can tailor how quickly you want the two inch drop to happen so auto is going to read how fast you're braking or how quickly you're coming to a, a stop and tailor it based on the riding that's going on at the time the auto short delay basically there will be a short delay before the two inch drop kicks in and the long delay is it's going to de delay it even longer before that two inch drop so if you want the two inch drop to happen i guess at the last second then you do the long delay and you can also lock the ride height here i guess maybe if you don't want the bike to drop at all i guess maybe if you're if you're doing technical terrain and the bike thinks you're coming to a stop but really you're just trying to get over like something technical and you don't want the bike to drop you'd probably lock the ride height so that's probably for like off-road application stuff i'm going to go long delay to see if i can feel the adaptive ride height when it drops and so that's it so you've got the one two three four five six seven different criteria that you can adjust for every ride mode and again this is custom b that i'm looking at so now that one's active i've got custom a active as well then also i've got my rain my sport mode those are active as well. I can shut those off if I want to. And so they just, they just won't be an option when I'm toggling with the mode button. That mode button right there is what's gonna toggle through my different modes. So if I know I never wanna use sport, I can just shut that off. Road is always gonna be active and available. You can never shut that one off. So a couple other things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click the home button here. That's gonna take me back home. Something that I'll show you real quick, you can actually change the display. So you're gonna wanna go to appearance and you can go dashboard customization and you can go widget once you go widget then if you hit the right button there you can go and you can pick which widgets you want on your home screen so you have the tire pressure monitoring you have your uh, trip like your trip a trip b like your range of fuel that you have left the bottom right i had that music i don't have a headset set up right now and then on the right you can also see like the bike diagnostics like the volts on your battery the engine temperature so you can monitor that so i'm going to go widget mode for now so bluetooth bluetooth is important because the only way that you can use your navigation and your music on this bike is if you have a phone Bluetooth to the system. This bike does not have a standalone GPS system on here, which is unlike the regular touring bikes, like your regular fairing model, shark nose, batwing fairing model bikes. You can just jump on the bike and use the navigation. But on this, you have to add a phone. So you'd go add a phone, you'd go to your, your settings in your iPhone or whatever and search for the Bluetooth and you'd connect it very similarly. So I'm gonna do that and have that set up for demonstration purposes when I'm riding the bike. The other thing I'll mention too is to get navigation guys that's all done through the harley davidson app so you got to get the harley davidson app you have to set up a profile and once you have that set up then you can basically put the address in of where you're going on your phone and then the phone will all transfer that over to the screen so it's kind of different you're not inputting the address on the actual bike you're inputting the address on your phone and the phone is basically transmitting to the screen there as far as your navigation is concerned here you've got your cruise control this is on so i believe you have to have your ignition on so you can see that icon there 
it's orange right now. So once that's on, this right here, up and down, you can set it and then you can go up and down by one mile increments. This right here is your high beam. You push that down for high beam. This is regular and if you wanna flash your high beam, you can just click that right there and flash it. This is for your heated grips. That's on the Pan America Special only. That one has, the bike has to be started there's a little icon right here that has like three different warmth rays that are coming up and you can click that two or three times. You can set basically the intensity of the heat that you want coming out of the heated grips. Here you have your horn and then your turn signal left and right. They are self canceling or you can just press it again and it will cancel out. Going over to this side. So this wheel right here is basically all your music. So you have your volume up and down. You have your track left and right. To use the music, guys, you have to have a headset paired with the bike. So there are no speakers on the Pan America. It's all done through a Senna headset or an, another type of headset. You can also do voice commands. If you have your headset set up with a microphone, you press this right there and then you can do your, your voice commands. The traction control button here, if you hold that down, you can shut off the traction control. Andrew and I, when we were out in the Mojave Desert, we found that it was good to shut off the traction control when we were off-road. Again, that's gonna be based on your comfort level and your preferences, but we found traction control when you're in the dirt is nice to, to be able to shut off. Hazard lights here. Again, this is your starting, your ignition, your, your cut. The mode button here is gonna cycle through the different ride modes like we talked about already. So you've got your A, you've got your B, rain mode, road mode, sport mode, off-road mode. The way you get into off-road plus, guys, you go to the off-road mode and then you hold down the mode button here. So I'm gonna hold that down and the icon turns into purple with a plus. So here you can see off-road mode is a motorcycle with a plus sign on it. I don't know what's up with my camera. It's not, that's not really showing up very well. So that's pretty much everything the switches do, guys. All the technical stuff. Here you got your fuel tank. This lifts up, lifts up there. Pretty self-explanatory. Right now we're using the center stand. The center stand comes standard on the, the Pan America Special. That allows you to, if you get like a hole, like a, a puncture in your rear wheel, allows you to work on your bike a little bit more easily on the trail. So that's, that's nice to have. Here you've got a fork lock. Turn the bars to the left, put the key in, turn the key up to 12 o'clock. Now I've locked, I've locked the bars at this point. The Special also has the steering stabilizer. Another thing that's pretty handy off-road, you're gonna want that. Again, if you're gonna go off-road with the bike a lot, the Special is the way to go. The Special also has the option of the laced wheels. These are the laced wheels here. You can see the spokes are all externally mounted out here. So you're running, you're able to run a tubeless tire, which another thing that helps you out if you need a plug, a puncture or a flat out on the trail. You've also got adjustable levers here. So you'll you'll spin this, this knob here. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna either bring the lever closer or further away from the grip. So by spinning this wheel, it's bringing the lever further or closer to the grip. And you can do that with uh, both sides. You can do that with the clutch as well. So right now it's at a three to a one. A one is the closest to the grip. And as I spin that, you can see that the lever goes further from the grip. And then at a one, the clutch lever goes closer to the grip. So if you have smaller hands, you know, basic rule of thumb is you're gonna wanna run it lower. If you have larger hands, you're gonna wanna run it at a higher number. And that's the same with the front brake as well. So I wanna go over with you your different options you have as far as charging capabilities on the bike. If you want to run like heated clothing or if you want to charge your cell phone basically all the electrical hookups on the bike i'm going to show you how to use them when they're active when they're not active so if you want to ch charge gopro cameras or your cell phone or something like that or run like heated clothing i'm going to show you what those are so first off we've got the the battery lead or the battery tender so this is what you're going to use when the bike is completely off to hook up your bike to charge the battery. If you're getting a Pan America, I would heavily recommend and almost say that's mandatory to have a battery tender for this bike. You're gonna wanna keep it hooked up and, and have your, your trickle charger on here for whenever you're not riding it, really, have it, have it hooked up unless you ride every single day. So while we're on the topic of battery, I thought I would show you guys where the battery is located and show how one is changed. So it's located underneath the radiator near the bottom front of the motorcycle and the battery has its own part number. So I'm assuming it's a 
unique battery and not shared by any of the other motorcycles in the Harley-Davidson lineup. The battery isn't the easiest battery in the world to change, so all the more reason to keep it on a tender and take care of it and maintain it properly. Of course, it's not super hard to change. You don't have to take off any of the wheels or anything to access the battery. Some of you guys will get that joke. But we were changing the skid plate on here to the part and accessory, more robust skid plate that you get out of the parts and accessory catalog. We're still learning some of the maintenance procedures on the bike, and so we had Tony change the battery and just see how hard it was and what it involved. I think it took him probably about 15 minutes or so. So not the hardest thing in the world, but at the same time, not super easy. Most of the Harley Davidson's out there, the battery is right underneath the seat. So it's going to take a little bit of getting used to for guys that are accustomed to going underneath the seat and changing out the battery. But this one is the only one that's hot or active when the bike is completely shut off. So there's also a USB-C on this side of the bike. So you can see here going on the right hand side of the screen of the infotainment system, you turn that counterclockwise and you're going to open up, you have a USB-C port right there. That's only active when the bike is in accessory mode. The primary purpose of that guys isn't so much to add utility to the bike for the rider and, and add charging capabilities as it is for technicians to jack into this and give you software updates on the bike. So I'm going to demo, demo that in just a second, but to kind of demonstrate for you guys, I have a couple different charging cords and different uh, hookups here. So I'm going to use my GoPro camera to basically demonstrate the different ways to charge. So if my bike is completely off and it's sitting here and I want to charge, say like my GoPro camera. So this right here, this is a, a battery tender lead to a USB. So I'm going to use this one here. I'm going to take my GoPro cord, a regular USB, USB-A, hook that in. This is a Hero 8, by the way. So it's a, okay, I broke that. Cool. <laughs> and then this plugs in here. So if we get a red light, that means it's charging. Okay, so now the camera is charging. So you can hook you can hook a phone in on that. Uh, again, you got to have the right cords and hookups. Um, I highly recommend this battery tender, by the way. This one that's a, that's a tender to a, a USB. That's been a lifesaver for me out on the road if I'm trying to charge cameras or whatever off of my battery lead. Okay, so you've also got some leads underneath the seat. So here you've got a couple leads here. So these here, these are the only ones that will be active if the bike is on and running, okay? Great for heated clothing, but if you wanna charge your cell phone while you're riding your bike, this is really the only way to do that. This battery tender lead, this turns off when the bike turns on. Here's what I got for this. So we've got one of these cords. I don't even know the name of this, so I apologize for that, but this will plug in here, and now I've got a battery tender lead here. So I'll go to my adapter, plug in my adapter here, and now I can plug in. So the bike's off right now, I'm gonna plug this in. You don't see any red dot there. So the camera is not charging right now. So just to reiterate there, I got a lot of stuff on here. So I had to, I had to do this, this adapter cord, and maybe there's a cord out there that will convert straight from this connector to a USB but I don't have one, so we're using this. So now we're gonna turn the bike on. Thank you, Andrew. My battery lead that I showed you first, that is now disabled, but it then turns on these heated gear and you can see my red light on my camera is on. And so that is now charging. So if you have a cell phone or something like that that you wanna charge while you're riding, you can probably stick it here in this cubby hole like so and run the cord and have it sitting here in a pocket. I obviously would use some type of a protected like padded case or something like that. So your cell phone isn't jumping around and rattling in here and cracking the screen and things like that. But this right here is the only way, unless you hook up an additional thing on your battery, which we're not gonna go into, but stock configuration as far as electronics and wiring, this is the only way to charge an electronic device. Now, I know a lot of people are asking about the USB-C that's on the side of the screen over here. So let's go over here. You do have a USB-C port on the right hand side of the screen. This turns counterclockwise. This opens up here. So this is not active or not hot when the bike is in ignition. The only way to make this active is if by putting the bike in accessory mode. So you cannot charge anything off of this. I know a lot of people probably think, okay, I'm gonna hook up my phone and I'm gonna have a handlebar mount for my cell phone. I'm gonna charge my cell phone off of this port. It won't work. And I don't know if there's any way to fix that, but in stock configuration, that won't work. The only way to charge the cell phone is in here, like I said before. So I'm gonna turn off the ignition here. I'm gonna show you how you do use that if you want. So ignition off. What I'm gonna do is put the bike into accessory mode. You hold that down 
for about four seconds and now I've put the bike into accessory mode. So maybe if you're if you're sitting alongside the road, maybe at a gas stop or something like that, you can put your bike into accessory mode and now I have use of this here. So I'm gonna grab a USB-C cord. So this is a C to C. So USB-C, I'm gonna plug this in here. Sorry, bad angle. Okay, I'm plug my camera in. Now this, the red light should turn on if I'm charging. There it goes. So now I'm charging so that it's active. As soon as I turn on the ignition, it turns off. This is no longer active. So some people may say, well, why is that? That's stupid. Um, all I can figure and talking to my service manager, Keith, the primary use and reason for this port right here is for updating the software in your infotainment system. I don't feel like it was really designed as an energy source for when you were riding the bike. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but that's kind of what it is what it is i would caution you doing that for long periods of time because it does drain your battery and then let's say you do that for an hour you might jump on your bike and then your bike won't start because you've drained your battery so be cautious about doing that again if you need to charge something for a long period of time the best way to do it is off of your heated gear ports right here and putting your cell phone in this little cubby hole right here just to recap guys if the bike is completely off the battery lead here the battery tender lead here is the only one that's hot or active. You can charge stuff off of it and you can hook up a trickle charger to it. If the ignition is on and the bike is running, you gotta use the heated gear port. And if you wanna go into accessory mode, you can use the USB-C on the side of the screen. All right, guys, so let's take the bike out and test out the different ride modes and test out my custom mode that I made. And I also wanted to test out the navigation and how the app integrated in with the screen and you know how well the navigation worked. So first off, I'll start off with the navigation here. So I set myself a point for a gas station that was only about two or three miles away just to test it out. So I have my app running in the background right now. And basically my route is being shown up on my screen there. I will say just to get this out of the way for First of all, that the, the screen is beautiful. It's bigger than your regular GTS infotainment system that comes in all the fairing model, big twin Harley Davidsons that a lot of us have, have ridden and, and been used to over the years. This screen and infotainment system does not nearly have the guts and the computing power that that infotainment system has. So this is kind of like a, a light version of that in a sense. And what I mean by that is a lot of the computing with the music and the navigation is 100% reliant on your cell phone. And so this is more of, of a display that takes all that information and the information that's being computed on your cell phone and displaying it up on the screen. So you do have like your limitations there. You know, if I, if I were to rank this, this navigation and the ease of use and its ability to be real accurate and just be a very user-friendly experience. If I had to rate that one through 10, if I gave like Google Maps and like Apple Maps a 10, this would probably be like around like a six. And the reason I say that is just because you're so reliant on the app. So if you're out on the road and you want to change your directions or maybe you want to go get gas all of a sudden, you know, on my Street Glide or, or any bike that has a GTS infotainment system, you can make those changes on the fly and you can control all the menus and, and everything with your fingertips. With this, once you, once you lock in your address or your destination, you set it and you're pretty much locked into that. You can't make any changes on the fly. So if I wanted to make any changes, I'd have to pull over and type in a new set of instructions. All you can really do is zoom in and zoom out. It is a touch screen that works pretty dang good, but it's just not as good as you know, the regular infotainment system. The music I didn't really test out. I wish I could have, but you have to have a headset that's linked up and I didn't have a headset to, to test that out. So that's yet to be determined there. That should work, I, I would assume, very similar to the, the GTS infotainment system without the ability to pipe music and, and everything in through the speakers. Um, which personally, when I'm riding my Street Glide, for example, I like to have my music piping through the speakers. The helmet's okay, but 
I just, I like my music to come through the speakers. I do like my navigation instructions through my headset and my helmet. I also like when I talk on the phone, I like that to come through the helmet as well. I've also heard too that you're very much at the mercy of your cell phone reception. So if you lose reception on your cell phone, then you're gonna lose your map. Uh, I have heard that you can download your maps. And so the, the map is right there and, and always accessible like your route, but I didn't test that. So that's another reason once again, that this navigation on the Pan America isn't as good as the implementation GTS system. So now that I've kind of told you guys the negatives, the positives are the screen's big. It's bigger than the GTS system that comes on the fairing model bikes. Colors are great. The display is nice. To be able to mix and match your widgets how you want them to show up on your screen is really nice as well. The menu system is relatively easy to flick through and get around and see what you want to see. So that's all a positive. But I think it's going to be a chore for people that are real serious about navigation and instructions to utilize the app with this screen you know i've I think sometimes too, when you turn the bike off and if you're in the mid route, when you turn your bike back on, it's gonna to wanna to right route you back to the start of your route. And so there's just a couple things that need to be worked out. It's not a really simple, easy user experience with the app. And I've used the app before I use it on the Pan America here because it's basically the same system that you can use for like your trip planner. Some people have used like the ride planner. You can go into harleydavidson.com, use the ride planner, and then you, know, you can save it to your profile on the computer and that will automatically transfer over to the app when you open it up on the cell phone. So I've, I've planned out some rides and I've uploaded them and so you can just click on the ride and take off and it will route you there. I really like the heads up display in the main menu there. You've got your miles per hour in bold. You've got your RPMs in this gauge that illuminates like in a half circle as you get up higher in the RPM and so it's definitely a very sporty dash and heads up display on this bike and all the information on there is really easy to read. Ride modes on this bike are huge especially if you're doing a combination of on-road and off-road you really get a lot better riding experience when you're in the appropriate mode so first off road mode I felt like it was a very good happy medium road mode is a perfect combination of both performance and electronic intervention if need be and also like your throttle response and engine braking when I clicked into sport mode the biggest thing that you notice right off the bat is you just get more power with less twist of the throttle so maybe you're feeling lazy that day and you just don't want to do a, a huge flick of the wrist going to sport mode and you just need a little flick of the wrist and you're going to get you know an equivalent amount of power so making the appropriate ride mode choice is really a big thing whereas you know a lot of just on road only motorcycles picking your ride mode is kind of not that important in my opinion i mean it gives you a little bit different feel and everything but so the bike in sport mode is just giving you everything it's got a lot sooner that and the suspension stiffens up a little bit more if you're you know going in if you're braking and diving into turns real hard and aggressively rain mode makes the throttle just really mellow as soon as that wheel even thinks about braking traction rain modes ahead of it and it's reducing power to the rear wheel so that the wheel won't break traction off-road mode is kind of the opposite side of the spectrum where it's going to let the wheels break loose and slip and slide a lot more it reduces the abs intervention it makes the bike skid and stop quicker than in rain mode rain mode you know that abs is going to come on really quick and be really really sensitive as well and if you want to even further reduce the amount of electronic intervention you can put it in off-road plus mode we found that pretty necessary when we were really giving it a lot of throttle off-road I felt like my rear wheel was reducing the power significantly if I was in like a road mode or something like that because it was trying its best not to let the wheel break traction back there which if you're off-road you're always breaking traction and so then your riding intuition has to kick in and you have to be less reliant on the electronic assists but all in all guys I feel like the electronics on this bike were executed extremely well by Harley Davidson I feel like that was a big question by myself by a lot of people was you know it, it's easy to put all these things on paper and make the bike seem good but when you actually get on it and ride it that's kind of the what tells the story is if everything works the way it's supposed to and if it's relevant and if, if there's value there in all these electronic assist things and, and the ride modes and the six axis IMU is taken advantage of and executed properly and there's just a lot more than just saying that you have these things on paper if I had to nitpick on one and you guys probably already guessed it, it would be the navigation. I just feel like that a lot of people aren't gonna use it or aren't gonna have a good user experience with the navigation just because of how cumbersome and the way it has to integrate into the bike. But I'm gonna continue to mess with the navigation and see if I can get it to work really well. I feel like maybe with a little bit of experience and using it, I can become a little bit more accustomed to it and how it works and feel a little bit more confident with it. Anyways guys, thanks a lot for watching this video. Hopefully I was able to help you out with this hands-on tech look at the Pan America. If you haven't already, make 
make sure you hit that subscribe button and I'll see you out on the trail. Later guys.